But as it is written, I've quoted this verse many times, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Now, in, for years of being a preacher and, uh, and doing hundreds and hundreds of funerals, I've, I, I've used that verse, not erroneously, but slightly out of context, I think, by, by always referring that verse to our eternal state of, of heaven. When we think of go to heaven, that verse fits in heaven, doesn't it? has not seen nor ear heard, neither has even entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for us. Now, I could use it in heaven, but it's really not talking about heaven. It's talking about the gospel's work in you and time and space right now. I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has even entered into the heart of man what God can do in your life in your spiritual transformation. That's how that verse is accurately translated. Now, with that said, with that said, I, I want to back up a little bit that what I just said was absolutely true, but uh, the culmination of our redemption is the day that we step into our eternal home with Jesus Christ. That's the culmination of redemption. That, that I am now where I was intended to be since Adam and Eve. We were always intended to live in heaven. We were always intended to be in fellowship with God. Sin came in, messed the whole plan up. But God's creative intention for the human race was to live forever in heaven and to live forever in fellowship with Him. That was His creative intention for the human race until sin came in and messed that up. Now, we know, I'm going to just back, well, this is really not a lot to do with the message, but I did want to just review some things. Many of you know when everything happened last February and I finally got back to the pulpit, I went into about a 10 to 12 week heaven series. We talked about heaven every week. I never studied a subject more proficiently than I did that subject of heaven. And we spoke right until July and when I went on a sabbatical. When I got done with the last message, I, I went on the three-month sabbatical. I told you all along during preaching that message, I thank you for being there um, because I'm preaching this for me. And if it helps you, great. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And, um, but, but I was preaching it for me. I, talk in, I talked to my, one of the counselors I referred to, Dr. Norman Wright in California on the phone, and I told him what I was doing. He says, Tim, that was probably the most therapeutic thing you could ever do for yourself. And I have to agree with him. I, to this day, I hang on to some of those truths. So let me just revisit some of those truths about heaven so we understand what our life is supposed, what, what our life is intended for and what it was always meant to be. Number one, truth number one, we were created to live there, not in an unredeemed earth. We were created to live in heaven, to breathe heaven's air. What we see now on earth was not God's best for us. I know you might find that shocking. <laughs> number two heaven is simply earth some of you might not have known that it's simply earth restored renewed and redeemed earth as it was supposed to be you can still go to this place and find some pretty beautiful place and this earth and still see some pretty beautiful places can't you us 19 ain't one of them but you can go other places and see some pretty neat places. You can see, go, go to the ocean. Just go to the ocean. If you're a beach person, and I go to the beach every once every five years, so I know. And, um, and you go to the beach, you look out at this beautiful ocean, and you don't see the concrete and the IHOPs and the cars and the traffic lights behind you. But you see that ocean, it's like, wow. I've been to the mountains of Romania and all over the world and saw some of the most beautiful places, amazing, amazing places I've ever seen. That says God made that. And then earth came in and did what we do, screwed things up. <laughs> and, um, and so, so we, this is our, our heaven, you will see the new heaven, simply a renewed heaven um, that we will inhabit for all eternity. Those loved ones, the saints of the Old Testament and all those who have passed since then, the loved ones who have gone beyond before us, my daughter, they're in a place where we call there's a present heaven. Now, where was that? Well, you, well, I'm going to read your passage in a few moments um, that is going to show you. I'm not going to get into all this, but it's not really the message. 
but they live in a present heaven. And then when at the resurrection of the, of the, of the body, at the second coming of Christ, the, they, they will get their new bodies back. And then after the thousand year millennial, the earth will be the renewed then, and a second renewal of the earth. And, and so, again, that's all in the series. Just go back and watch every one of the 12 messages, and you'll get it, you'll get it all with all the, all the verification for all that stuff. So the, so the fourth truth is we receive our resurrected, glorified bodies back at the return of Christ. And these bodies will be our permanent bodies for all eternity and our permanent, in our permanent home. Fifth truth. This is my, my favorite. This is what ministers to be more than all the rest. Families will have special relationships for all eternity. Husbands and wives, children and parents. Those things that started on earth, those unique bonds that started on earth will not dissipate when we hit heaven. Jesus prayed on earth as it is in heaven. So you have, a, you have that child that's gone on or parent or brother or sister. They'll know who you are. One of the great concerns I had was when I got to heaven, my daughter would look and say, Hey, Tim, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> Not going to happen. She's going to look, look at me and say, Dad, it's good to have you home. Pastor, what do you base that on? Matthew 8, 11 and other verses. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Granddad, father, son. Eating together. Having a meal Chick-fil-A, maybe, in, 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 in heaven. Sixth truth, our uniqueness of our individuality, personalities, humor, idiosyncrasies, the good stuff, will still be with us. We're going to be us. If you have a unique sense of humor, you'll have that unique sense of humor for all eternity. If you're a little ditzy, you'll be a little holy ditzy. Um, for, for all, 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 all eternity. If you're a little naive, you'll have a little holy naivety um, for all eternity. In other words, God made us this way. We are certain every human being has different DNA and we're all different and that doesn't change. He doesn't make us lemmings with individual personalities and temperaments and everything, but it's all going to be redeemed and all the bad stuff, the fears and the insecurities and the manipulations and all the other stuff that will be left behind because that old nature will be gone once and forever. Once and for all. Now the last one, I can't prove this scripturally, but I believe it to be true. The Gaitha vocal band <laughs> will be the primary worship band uh, in heaven. Okay. Mark it down. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 I can't prove that, but I believe that to be absolutely true. Now with that said, I was kidding about the last one. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Let me write that down. I'm going to check that out with my other pastor and see if that guy's preaching heresy. No, 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 I was kidding about that. But with that said, all the things that there'll be much that we cling on to here on earth now that we maybe deem so important, most of it probably undiscerned and unrealized, that will be extinct on the streets of gold. I want to look at just a few of these things that we called eternal extinctions. What is not going to follow us there? I'm not going to mention money. I'm not going to mention any of those obvious things. I want to be a little bit more subtle than that. Let me read, first of all, Ephesians 2, verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. That would definitely apply to Jeanette. <laughs> just the many sins part, not, not, not because... Well, you know, I mean, you know, the different things that she deals with, the gambling issue and the you know, alcohol issue that she deals, that deals with, but stuff like that. But she'll be okay. She'll be, we're praying for her. And so you were dead. The word, the, word, the word dead, I just loved it. The word dead is a word where you get corpse from. It, 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 somebody is a walking corpse. So you were a walking corpse before you met Christ. That's what it says. Verse 2, you used to live in sin like the rest of the world. Obeying the de devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world, he is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. In other words, that's all you knew. You, that's all you knew. Is this, this lifestyle was all you knew. That was your normal. Verse 3. 
All of us used to live that way. I just said that, didn't it? Following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature, but by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everybody else. Verse 4. But God was so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It was only through God's grace that you can be saved. Now here's the verse on the exchange life. For He raised us up from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we were united in Christ Jesus or in Christ Jesus in many other translations. These are the most powerful words in the world. In Christ Jesus. United in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. We'll see this later on in the message, I hope. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness towards us as shown in all He has done for us who are, who are united with Christ Jesus. Wow. <coughs> Excuse me. For God saved you by His grace when you finally got to work. Thank you, thank you. A few people wrote that down, but it's a, but God saved you by His grace when you finally tithe. No, that didn't work either, huh? Even though that would be great, if that was true. But um, um, God saved you by His grace when you finally mowed the pastor's lawn. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that nothing worked. It says God saved you by His grace when you what? What comes after the word believe? Period. Period. And there's, no other, there's no addendum. There's no asterisk there. There's nothing, no point to add to that when you believed. Wow. And you can't take credit for this, Paul said, not me. It's a gift from God. So we're saved by grace when I believe. So it's just believe. I'm saved by grace when I believe. Period. That period is really important. Because so many of our live our lives without putting a period there. We put a comma or a dash and we add something after that. Not that we even know we're doing it. Most of the time we probably don't know we're doing it. But most of us live, me included, great portions of our Christian life without putting a period at the end of that sentence. And we keep adding things to what it'll take to achieve God's approval and God's righteousness. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you have done, verse 9. So none of us can boast about it. Makes sense, doesn't it? It's not like I'm going to get to heaven and say, look what I've done. It's no boasting. And here it is. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. Now notice that, that, how that, that works. If most of us live this way. So we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. He created us in Christ Jesus. We reverse that in our lifestyle. In other words, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, my religion, my churchianity, my brand of Christianity is going to be based upon how I'm performing at any given moment in the things I should or, or think I should be doing for God. We call that a performance gospel. But the apostle was very clear. He put, he put verse 10 in there after verse 2 after verse 5, after verse 8, after verse 9, he put verse, he verse 10 in there because that's the last thing he does. We are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things, good works your translation may have, that he planned for us. He placed us in Christ, saved us by grace, seated us together with heavenly places, forgave us of our sins, and I can go to other verses, Romans 5 and 3, where it says we've been justified, declared righteous before a holy God. So then we could. The good works didn't come till after the eternal work of salvation. 
That's a very important thing. Because I want to teach us as a people, I want to learn myself, as subtle as it gets, to be a discerner and a smart listener of the gospel. I venture to say some Christians, my friends, are not discerners of the gospel or discerners of what they listen to or even a discerner of their thought life. Sometimes I realize my thought life is not really based in the gospel. My thought life is based in the law. I think like the, un the finished work is not finished. So I unfinish the work even though I know it's finished. That just gives me peace. Oh, it makes me a jittery mess. It makes me like walking on my driveway with bare feet in July. With my relationship with God. Ah, ah. I'm going to do more, pray more, read more, study more, memorize more, something more. So I can feel better about my walk with God. Or better yet, God will think better about my walk with God. I actually start telling God how he's thinking. God, you're thinking good about me because I'm doing good. Or God, you're thinking bad about me because I'm not doing so good. Right? God says, no, actually... All my thoughts towards you are peace. <laughs> All my thoughts up towards you are based upon grace. It has nothing to do with your performance. There are so many that will teach much about the gospel, but they'll fall short of the gospel's radical nature. I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God can do for those that love him. Now that's, that's, that talks about a radical transformation that can take place in a Christian's life. He, unto him, Ephesians 3 verse 20, who can do exceedingly and abundantly above all, strong language, you have to ask or think. That's not talking about winning the lotto. Or doing some great thing or getting some great prayer answer. That's talking about your spiritual transformation. That's talking about a work that God can do in your life. Not for your life. Not on the outside of this life. But this life. This life right here. The inner life of the man or the woman of God. He can do exceedingly and abundantly above all. In other words, he can make the insecure person secure. He can heal broken hearts. He can buy back wasted years. He can restore the lost years of a lost childhood. There's nothing he can't do in you. That's what he's referring to. I'm getting way off the message here. One of these, one of a great, somebody I know, I've known as a grace preacher, and I've heard him on, that's how I knew him anyway, and I hate ties. Everyone says, I love it when you wear a tie, but I want you to know how painful they are. <laughs> so when you shake, I love it when you wear a tie, just know I did it for you, okay, not for me, because I don't, I don't like these things. God didn't create them, man created them, and they're part of the fall, <laughs> and uh, they're not, they're not right. They're just not. And nothing, no one's, do you like people walk around with a hand around your neck? No, you wouldn't like that. Somebody walks you down the street with a hand around your neck. Hey, that's just, just a guy just strangling me all week long like that. What are you doing? That's just the guy strangling me. Well, that's what a boat, that's what a tie is. But you can't charge him with a crime. It, it just strangles you all week long. Back to my message. Okay. Yeah. Had to fix that. I'm sorry. There's something stirring up for 20 years. Just had to come out of me. There. This, anyway, this, <laughs> this preacher, and I, I like him. I, I, I heard him preach a message on imputed righteousness one time. I said, wow, I don't even hear that terminology that much. And he was right on, he was right on game with it. He really nailed the message. I said, wow, that's, that's, that's impressive. And then I heard him see, preach a message about justification one time. I said, oh, justification. That's, that, that's one of my favorite themes. That is my favorite theme. And he nailed that message. And then he comes out recently and says, um, you, need to, you need to speak in tongues with proof of the Holy Spirit. Oh. What happened to grace plus nothing? All of a sudden it became grace plus tongues. It doesn't have to be tongues. It could be grace plus anything that you want to add to it. Um, subtle as it is. Now this is, the, this is the tricky part. Okay. Why didn't we discern that? Why didn't those who believe in the gospel say yes? All of a sudden say, whoa, that's not right. We have to become acute listeners, not only to what's spoken out here, 
but what's spoken in here. So we can filter it through the gospel and filter it through the grace of God. If not, you'll find yourself going down a road that is not a grace-based road. I did a funeral um, recently. I shared this, I think, on a Wednesday night a month or two ago. And, um, and in the funeral, I was talking about heaven, actually. And I, I mentioned to the fact that King Saul, you know, the bad king of Israel, first king before David, that bad guy, he, um, he went to heaven. And that Saul's in heaven. And so after the funeral, somebody that came out to me after and said, you know, I like what you said, da, 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 but I want to disagree. I think Saul is in hell. I said, okay. Did you see him there? Or what? <laughs> no, I, I didn't say that. I thought that, but I, I didn't say that. <laughs> and no, no. I, and I said, well, I don't, I, I um, don't, don't think that. I think Saul is in heaven. What are you based on? Well, let me read you the verses here. It says this. Now I got, it said, let me do some back. This is Second, First Samuel chapter 28. Saul, the kingdom's unraveling. He goes, Samuel's dead. He goes to a witch and says, can you find me Samuel? She's dead. Can you find me Samuel? Because I need to ask Samuel a question. So he goes to the witch. The witch is not a Jewish witch. She's just a pagan witch. So she does whatever witches do. I have never really witnessed that. And, and all of a sudden, it says he sees Samuel coming out of the ground before Jesus led captivity captive. So he, he, he was coming out of the ground. So there's Samuel coming out of the ground, and he comes and he freaks the woman right out. Oh, my God, it worked. <laughs> and then, then there's Samuel. Oh, my, it never worked before. There he is. Oh, my God, hide me. And, um, and so the so woman's a little freaked out. Saul just seemed to go along with the flow here. And so, and, and so what does it, well, I mean, don't be afraid, the king told her. What do you see? I see a God, small g, coming out of the earth, she said. What does he look like? Saul asked. He is an old man wrapped in a robe, she replied. Saul realized it was Samuel. So he fell on the ground before him. Samuel talking, back from the dead. Why have you disturbed me? <laughs> By calling me back. Can you imagine Samuel? Oh man, I'm back here with you? I was just in heaven with God and Jesus, hanging out with Moses and Noah, and I was having, and you call me, I have, to, I have to deal with you? I've dealt with you when I was in life. Now I'm dead, I still have to deal with you. He didn't say that, but that's my little paraphrase in there. And so, why are you disturbing me calling me back? Because I'm in deep trouble, Saul replied. The Philistines are at war with me, and God has left me and won't reply by prophets or dreams, so I've called for you um, to tell me what to do. Skipping down to verse 19. Samuel tells him, Saul, that ain't going to work. You're dying. But this is what he says. What's more? The Lord, Samuel talking, the Lord will hand you and the army of Israel over to the Philistines tomorrow, and you and your sons will be there with me. Samuel just said it. Tomorrow you're going to die, you and your sons, and tomorrow you'll be here, heaven, where they were at that point, with me. So I read those verses with this man, and he just sort of looked at it, and he didn't really know what to process it. He says, well, I just don't, you have to repent. People need to repent. And he kept, they, there needs to be repentance in the church. I didn't quite know what he really was even talking about. But, but he kept hammering his fist. He was very adamant. There needs to be repentance. So I said, okay, so uh, we, we're saved by grace. He's, yes, we're saved by grace. Plus nothing, plus nothing but repentance. No, we're saved by grace but in repentance. But we've got to repent. And so I was trying to get him to see there was a, a um, contradiction in what he was trying to show me and try to, and, but he wouldn't show me that. He wouldn't do that. Now, I wanted to say something. As you become a, discerned, um, lis a discerning listener, and again, never mu as much on the outside as this, this is probably more important. That you discern your own thoughts and discern the own premises of your own mind. Because that's a lot more subtle. And you can go on years and not even have a true discernment of your own thoughts. But there's a Greek word. I'm going to teach you a little bit of Greek this morning. I only, I only teach you important stuff. There's now, first of all, you can take epi. That's a prefix in Greek. Oh my, that's a suffix in Greek. Put it around any word and make it Greek. As far as I'm concerned. Okay. <laughs> If you're Greek, don't ever repeat this. I'll deny I ever said it. But, so, so you need to repent and be saved. You need to 
be saved and speak in tongues. You need to do this and live right. You need to turn from this or that. Epi, baloney, oh my. <laughs> There's the word. You might want to write it down, and, and it's pretty fluent. Epi, baloney. It's easy to pronounce. Epi, baloney. Baloney. That's baloney. You know what baloney is? It's an Italian cold cut. It's not good for you. And, and, and it's, 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 um, <laughs> it's I, 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 it means no. It's, I have a gracious relationship with God. God doesn't need me to do anything. Nothing. Simply to respond to what his initiations. Discern, discern, the, the, discern anything that adds performance to, to a performance-free gospel. Let me tell you a few sna snafus for this. Those of you who are serious about your faith, you'll watch others that don't seem as serious, and they'll live in a certain lifestyle maybe and have certain practices you don't approve of, and you can show them right in the um, iPad or Bible, whatever, I have a bunch of Bibles in there, um, where, where they are wrong for that lifestyle, and you can do that. Just, just, just be discerning of, of that when, when you see these folks because these, um, it's not my job to please the gospel. That's the Holy Spirit's job. It, it's my job just to preach it and to let it out. It's not my job to figure out who needs to be forgiven. That's God. It, it's, it's my job simply to love and to be accurate and to be true to the grace and the mercy of God. Chuck Swindoll said this. I got actually two quotes. One came to me on Facebook because I posted this on Facebook and I, I wrote that one down. I got it here this morning. But Chuck Swindoll said, when you really preach the message of grace, you will find people to take advantage of it and live like they should not. Or you probably have never really preached grace. <laughs> Chuck said it, not me. <laughs> then, then Martin Lloyd-Jones said this. If some people do not accuse you of teaching heresy in your teaching of grace you're not really teaching grace. The grace of God does not give people a license to live whatever they want. The grace of God imparts a life to people so they can live a life glorifying God. It's not a behavioral modification. It's an exchange life that takes place. Let me just get into three quick external extinctions, probably just two. And um, then we'll close, because I just the time factor. Stealth legalism is extinct in heaven. I'm not talking about billboard legalism. That's the easy stuff. You've got to wear, dress a certain way, act a certain way, behave a certain way. You can't do this. You can't do that. All the rules and the regulations of churchianity, that's, that's billboard legalism. To be accepted by God. I was talking to one woman recently and well, a couple of years ago now I guess it was, it was she was walking into one church and she had yeah, her skirt was um, I don't know exactly I didn't see it but she said it wasn't down to her ankles it was sort of down, down to her knees she was a you know, middle aged woman and, doesn't, and she wore a skirt down to her knees and she was walking down the aisle and somebody with had a cane was in the front row tapped her on the leg so we got that skirt needs to get a little bit lower oh okay she loved that church <laughs> and I, and and I, that, that's billboard legalism. That's just people that have way too much time on their hands. <laughs> that, that's what that is. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the subtle stuff. This is not the Judaizers of Galatians and the antinomists and all those guys. This is legalism I'm talking about produced by those who understand even the core tenets of the gospel, yet in a subtle self-deception mix stuff with it. And we have to be careful. There's a movement in churchianity today where there's so much social activism, and I love social activism. I think feeding the poor is amazing. We need to feed the poor. We need to help the homeless. I couldn't agree more. The Hannah Grace Foundation is going to be helping foster kids, hopefully not only in Pinellas County, but if, if God blesses it and breathes on around the world. We'll be dealing with orphanages and feeding people and getting ho homes for kids that have no place to go. We have all sorts of plans to help these niches in society that need help. Don't get me wrong. But, but understand this. That doesn't replace my standing in Christ. That does not enhance my standing in Christ. 
That does not embellish my standing with Christ. That doesn't make me more spiritual or less spiritual if I do it or I don't do it. And this is where we make the mistake. Churchianity activity without a life lived in the Spirit produces artificial service. I'll say that again because I just outlined it in my notes. Churchianity activity, stuff we do around here, church life, without a life lived in the Spirit produces artificial service. We do bunches of things with God, but we do it through our own power, our own strength, and for our own reasons. And not a heart motivated by love. It's a heart motivated maybe by fear, by approbation, to being noticed, or whatever that is. But not a heart that's just driven by the love they have for God. It's not about doing a bunch of stuff for God. It's about knowing the one that you're doing it with, for Parents, teach this to our kids. Teach, drill this in our kids' heads. It's not about doing a bunch of stuff. We used to tell our Hannah Grace all the time, honey, you do what you want to do. Don't be led to do anything. I mean, don't make people put a trip on people and say, hey, you got to teach nursery. And my Hannah goes, no. I teach nursery. I have to get up early. I don't want to teach nursery. She was so free in the grace of God. She, didn't, she just, just was relaxing who she was. No one was going to put a trip on her or no one was going to fit her through a mold or anything like that. We never did it. We purposed to teach her of liberty and freedom in Christ since she was a little girl and told her that, Hannah, you just live your life before God. It's you and Jesus. And He's for you and He loves you. It's you and Jesus. And my wife was such an amazing mother um, that taught her these things. So I don't teach activity we teach truth. Our youth group teaches truth. We want activity, but we want to teach truth before, so that truth will produce the activity. I don't want activity without truth. I don't want to get a bunch of busy people running around the community that don't, can't tell you what justification is or what happened at the cross or what it means to be washed by the blood of the Lamb. I, don't, I, don't want, to, I want people to actually know what happened with that cross. See, good works come from the cross. They're not a path to the cross. It's what flows from the cross, not how we get to the cross. Christian service is a fruit of the cross. Not our way to inherit the cross. Any fruit that I have before I go to the cross and understand my exchanged life isn't real fruit. It's like that plastic fruit. I grew up with on the table that never fooled anybody. <laughs> in fact, they became projectiles in my home. My brother would throw them at me, something like that. So we, we learn this. We teach these things. We discern that, that, that we, we, works come from the cross and not the road to it. We discern it. Now, it's one thing to discern the message, but discern it in here. You know what Tim Kelly does all the time? I didn't pray enough today. Jeez, I got up a half hour later than I should have. Hmm. Didn't spend enough time in the Word. I didn't do this enough this week. I wish I was more disciplined in this area of my life. And I'm thinking, you know, if I'm, if I'm disappointed in me in these areas, then God must be right. See the self-deception that's in that? I've re I redefined the gospel to myself. And I've been studying it 30 years. Then I catch myself, no, I'm not going to think like that. I'm free in Christ. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm seated together with Christ. I'm complete in Him. He doesn't mark my iniquities. He doesn't have a ruler out with, my, with a legal pad and saying what I'm doing good and doing bad. He just loves me just the way that I am and accepts me just the way that I am. Then you do that, and it's easy again. The other way just makes it jittery. The last thing I want to say because of time is I always, I apologize, I get you guys out of here late. The second service gets abused. You, you, you do. First service, we get you out early. I always have you an hour and a half. Number two, incredible testimonies are extinct in heaven. We all love a good story. We all love the great redemption of a, a deep sinner they got saved. We hear like Ted Bundy got saved. 
and death row. And that's amazing. I, he probably did. According to James Dobson, he absolutely got born again on death row before he was executed. Ted Bundy, the serial killer. Wow. Then we love Hollywood stars and athletes that get saved. Well, wow, that one got saved. Wow. Of course, I don't know anyone in Hollywood that's saved. But must be a couple. But, but they, they get saved. And, and, there, and then there's Tim Tebow. He got saved. And that athlete got saved. And that guy gave glory to God between sips of his beer and, um, and, uh, and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist that and, um, and and stuff. So so yeah, that's 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 a that's um that's a mate. That's that's great. I look at it. but you know what? Heaven wasn't up there when Tim Tebow got saved. Heaven didn't go. Whoa, we got Timmy. Look at him. He's gonna be a professional athlete, popular all over the place. This is awesome. We got Tim. That wasn't Tim Tebow, not Kelly. <laughs> Actually, they probably did happen. They probably said, we got Tim Tebow. And then they said, then we got Tim Kelly. Then we got Sean Curtin. Then we got Alton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alton Brown. We got, we got Alton too. Wow. Look at, look, and everyone that gets saved causes rejoicing. Rejoicing from the angels in heaven. There are no great testimonies in heaven. Everybody is a great testimony. And know what the testimony is about? His grace. Not us. Not the fact that we believe. It was the fact that His grace made, it, made us able to believe. Let me go back and revisit you with that verse one more time. So in the, ages to, in the coming ages, different translation, He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read it again from the first passage I had from the other verse, but this is a different translation. Verse 7. So God can point to what? No, you don't have that verse up there. So God can point to us in all future ages. Point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and His kindness towards us as shown in all He has done for us to be united in Christ Jesus. So for all eternity, as we are in heaven, God points to us. You want to see an example of my grace? Al Erickson, the streets of gold. Dan Johansson, Mercy Street down the road. Go down the list. Jeanette Grider. Yes, Jeanette Grider. Had to be by Grace Avenue. <laughs> in the next neighborhood over. <laughs> and, 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 and go down the list. And everyone who inhabits the, the heavenly city, my friends, screams of the mercy and the grace of God. There'll be no boasting. There'll be no pride. There'll be no righteousness. There'll be no, there's Billy Graham. Because next to Billy will be some, someone, some mom that raised the children right that we never even heard of has the same crowns and the same rewards that Billy Graham has. Heaven's heroes, there'll be none. Jesus will be the hero of heaven and Jesus alone. There, Jesus, thank you for these... Um